Okay. Hi, doctor. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much for having me. So you are a cancer research doctor at Johns Hopkins, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. Is that where you are right now? That is where I am right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's great. And you've got a book out called Is Cancer Inevitable? I'm hoping that the book is a little bit more optimistic than the title suggests. <laughs> the title's a little so, gloomy. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yes. You know, in fact, the reason that I wrote the book was that, you know, it was during the time of the pandemic where everything kind of felt dark and a little depressing. And I was thinking, you know, um, we have so many people who reach out to me and say, you know, we haven't seen you, you work so hard, why haven't you cured cancer yet? <laughs> And, um, and so I thought, you know, let me talk about the fact that we've made so much progress in the field in the past few decades. Um, you know, I started as a cancer researcher 30 years ago and many cancers like breast cancer and melanoma were death sentences. And now our five year survival rate for them is above 90%. And so I just wanted to sort of get that message of hope out there that even if cancer in and of itself is inevitable, dying from cancer is not. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. I think you had a personal issue with cancer. Uh, I lost my father to cancer way, way back in the early 1980s. And I know that um, things have come a long way since the 80s in terms of treatment. It's so true. Um, so first of all, you know, our diagnostic tools are so much better than they ever used to be. I think there's been a lot of public health messaging that gets the word out about cancers and screenings and people are more diligent about going and getting screened for, you know, any changes, whether it's a colonoscopy, a mammogram, getting skin checks. And, you know, that's something I definitely like to encourage people to do. Um, and the therapies that we have today are just amazing. You know, we talk a lot about immunotherapy, which is a type of therapy that basically trains your immune system to attack cancer cells, recognize them as foreigners, um, and uh, just also, you know, encourage the immune system to become more and more effective. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about is, is any new treatments, because I know that when he was doing it, he basically had chemo and radiation. That's right. And now we have so many, we can sequence a tumor, look to see what genetic mutations are there, um, direct drugs against those mutations. We have, as I mentioned, immunotherapy. And what we're really trying to find now is ways to make those drugs even more effective than they already are. Um, I think what for me, the work that we do in my lab, we look at how something called a micro environment, so basically the neighborhood around the tumor, how changes in those cells as they age impact the way a tumor responds to therapy or the way a tumor moves around the body. Um, and what's been really fascinating to me is you can have a tumor cell that has a mutation in a gene for which we have a drug, right, to target that particular mutation. Um, and if you take that tumor cell and you put it in an old setting versus a young setting, it behaves completely differently. And so trying to understand what those signals are in those different settings that allow a tumor cell to respond or stop responding is really important as well. You mentioned immunotherapy. Did that come out of uh, HIV research? Is there any overlap between those two? Um, I wouldn't say it came out of it. There's definitely, you know, things that we understand about the immune system that we learn from HIV research, we can apply to cancer and vice versa as well. Um, you know, a lot of the immunotherapy we have today is credit uh, to people like Jim Allison, um, who has done, he was, you know, he um, has done a lot of work on a, a molecule called PD-1, which is what we call a checkpoint inhibitor, a checkpoint. Uh, that is present on immune cells. And by inhibiting that checkpoint, we can allow the immune system to sort of do its thing and kill tumor cells. Let me ask you something about, I know this is a big topic, but the causes of cancer, do we really understand what, I mean, I know we have some givens like smoking, uh, overweight, I think is another one that is- uh, Sun exposure. Sun exposure, okay. Right. But, but do we know, there are people who don't do any of those things 
who right. get who get cancer. Do, sure. Do we so really some know? Of it, of course, so sorry. Some of it is hereditary. Um, there are genetic, uh, you know, uh, mis genetic um, changes that we might inherit, and some of it we just don't understand why we know what those changes are we don't understand necessarily why they occur and as you know you know most cancers and by most i mean 90 percent of cancers are diagnosed in people over the age of 45. so we know that there are changes that happen during aging that really impact uh, tumors and tumor development and progression what's the ratio to men and women um, well, the incidence ratio, so it's kind of interesting because one out of every two women will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime and one out of every three men, but more men die of cancer than women. So it's sort of an interesting uh, paradigm there. What's the number one type of cancer that tends to kill people? So the cancer with the lowest survival rate is pancreatic cancer. It has only a 9% five-year survival rate. And we don't really understand why that is. To some extent, it's because many of those are diagnosed very late because that cancer doesn't cause a lot of symptoms until much later in the history of the disease. And also it's a cancer that invades very rapidly to distant organs such as the liver and, and uh, the lungs, etc. I know I went in and had a something called a skeletal survey. Hmm, is, is that uh, a good place to start for cancer screening with people? Um, did you? So I don't remember if you mentioned whether you had a previous cancer diagnosis or was your dad who had a cancer diagnosis, correct? No, it was my father. He, he passed okay. away from cancer, but I went in and had a screen done Mm -hmm. about four or five years ago and my doctor suggested a skeletal survey which was essentially an x-ray of, right. of the body, right? Yeah, um, so you know uh, a skeletal survey, I don't know whether it was PET imaging or an actual x-ray, um, that will show you cancer, you know if it was an actual x-ray it's going to show you cancers that are in the bones um, and I don't know why you would be asked to do that unless there was some suspicion you had something that could have metastasized the body. You know, I have to admit, I don't know enough about that to understand why that would have been done as part of a routine screen. Okay, well, what would normally be done as a routine cancer screening? Um, so, you know, I think some people get PET imaging if there's a reason to sus suspect that's called uh, positron emission topography. Um, if there's a reason to suspect they might have cancer, but they're really the sort of screens de rigueur are things like mammograms, uh, prostate exams, colonoscopies, skin exams, and that sort of thing. This might sound like a strange question, but how does one suspect that they might have cancer? What kind of symptoms do people exhibit, if any? Yeah, so it depends on the cancers. Obviously, feeling a lump is, you know, a, a clear sign you should go. Or if you have a mold that starts to change or look different. But for cancers that aren't obvious, you know, like an ovarian cancer, um, you might have symptoms that many, many women have, like bloating or, um, you know, just some abdominal pain and discomfort. Um, you might just be super tired. Some of some leukemias present because someone who used to be able to, you know, run up a flight of stairs one day finds himself like unable to go up four stairs without gasping for breath. Um, and so they go to their doctor because they have this extreme fatigue. Uh, night sweats are a sign of uh, advanced cancer. And I'm not talking about just, you know, sort of the night sweats that you have when you're going through menopause or something. I'm talking about like you have to literally change the sheets because, you know, they're, you've, you've soaked them. So there are a lot of weird uh, symptoms that you wouldn't necessarily associate with cancer. Um, and that's why some cancers like pancreatic cancer are diagnosed so late because, you know, these are not things that you would automatically think are cancer. Let me ask you something about your book. How is the book set up? So if I pick up the book, what is it going to be very medical journal or is it going to be more like a story novel? Yeah, so it's sort of a interspersing of a little bit of my personal journey. I grew up in Africa, um, how I came to love science and some, you know, silly anecdotes all throughout the book. It's very much written for a lay audience. 
Um, and I give a lot of credit for the sim simple language in there to my amazing uh, co-writer, Tim Wendell, who also wrote books like Cancer Crossings, for example. And he's just he was just fantastic in helping me sort of um, take the jargon and make it palatable. So it really is intended to be a book for a lay audience. And uh, it's intended to be a book to say, hey, here are you know some of the things we know about cancer. Here's some of the work that we have going on in our lab, as well as some of the work that other people are doing, and just you know sort of send I hope what I hope is a message of hope. The the term in here cure uh, it says researchers are beginning to whisper the word cure. Do you foresee that in our lifetime? Cancer is so varied, though. I mean, it's. You're not going to have a one size fits all cure, right? Never. Um, even within a type, you know, first of all, there's so many different types of cancer breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, melanoma. Even within a type of cancer like melanoma, we have so many different subtypes. Um, and so there's, I honestly don't believe there'll be a one size fits all cure ever. However, um, I think that what we will see is a way to manage the disease. Um, the way we manage diabetes or the way we manage high blood pressure and really in a way, um, you know, I think that's a little bit a part of President Biden's moonshot initiative, you know, the way that we're thinking about these things is uh, to really try to understand how we can keep cancer at bay um, or treat them so patients can have a healthy life even if they do have cancer. And what we're seeing, especially in the melanoma field, you know, is that 25 to 30% of people who come in with advanced melanoma are actually getting their lives back after a course of chemotherapy, of uh, immunotherapy, sorry. Okay, what is the process for immunotherapy? Is it IV? Uh, it is for the most part, yes. So similar to chemo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Although I, you know, again, I, sh I am not, um, I'm not a clinician, so I'm not on the forefront of these things. Um, so I don't know whether they are delivering these in uh, oral format yet. So what do you do for your day's work? You, you spend most of your time in a lab? That's right. Um, so I am a, a PhD, basic science researcher. Um, and what we do is, you know, we investigate different avenues within our lab of trying to understand really how tumor cells are talking to the normal cells about around them and how those conversations change with age. Um, you know, we use, we try to identify different molecules that are expressed on either the tumor cells or the normal cells that we can target to disrupt those conversations and make tumor cells start responding more effectively to therapy or uh, metastasizing less than they do. Okay, great. Uh, is your book out now? It is out, yes. Okay, and do you have a website for the book or a personal one you want to give out? Sure. So the book is available at either Johns Hopkins Wavelengths Press or on Amazon. Um, and um, my, I, you can find me on Twitter at Ashani TW. And also my website is at the Johns Hopkins School of Health. Okay, great. School of Public Health, sorry. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and sharing about Absolutely. your book. And best of luck with it. I hope it does well. Thank you so much.